2009 Junior Player of the Year nominee, Carl Ferns. To be honest, I didn't know that much about Carl Ferns prior to doing this video, but I was having a look at the 2009 Junior Player of the Year nominee class. If you've missed it, I've already done videos on Winston Stanley, who was one of the nominees from New Zealand, Richard Kingy, uh, who was one of the nominees from Australia. We've got Carl Ferns today. And the eventual winner of that award was Aaron Cruden, also from New Zealand. So it's kind of an interesting one to look at. How were these guys assessed in 2009 as kind of some of the hottest young talent uh, at the under-20s tournament? And then kind of how did their careers progress? If you haven't seen Winston Stanley or Richard Kingy's videos, check those out. Because they maybe didn't quite go according to plan. Carl Ferns' career, though, from what I can gather, uh, seems to have gone... Pretty bloody, uh, bloody successfully, man. He's been a, um, a professional rugby player playing tons of games for various different clubs for the last, goodness me, since like, you know, 2008. I record this in 2021, so a very long time. Um, he's a typical hard man. Uh, I think best known, the fact that you, if you Google Carl Ferns, it also says related searches Gavin Henson. And if you, if you know that story, you'll know what I'm talking about. I didn't know that story. Maybe I did in a, in a, a long time ago when it actually happened. But Carl Ferns knocked out his teammate at a bar, Gavin Henson. Uh, he also knocked out a few bouncers, apparently, although that was, only, that was never proven when he was at sale. The dude's a hard, hard man. Very hard man. But anyway, we'll go over his career, some of the kind of uh, key events, and kind of to see how it panned out for him. And, um, yeah, you guys can share any memories you had of Carl Ferns' career. Like I said, he played age grade, uh, rugby for England. He's a loose forward, I think primarily a number eight, but I think he could play, uh, multiple positions in the back row. Uh, plays age grade, plays under 16s, plays under 18s, plays under 20s, competes in that 2009 tournament where they end up uh, losing in the final to New Zealand, 44 28. Uh, he gets the nomination for Junior World Player of the Year. Remember, some of the guys in that England team he was in in 2009, that, that under-20s team, included guys like Ben Youngs, uh, Jamie George, Courtney Laws. So it was a pretty good team. So you had to be pretty outstanding uh, to kind of outshine some of your teammates in that regard. So he was obviously a pretty bloody good uh, young player. At that stage, he's with Sale Sharks. Um, where he plays like I think 37 odd games for them and it's impressive because he's only a young man but of those games 29 are starts so he's not kind of just getting token minutes you know off the bench as a youngster he's uh, he's clearly you know seen as a, uh, a good kind of prospect for them um, he does move to uh, to Bath though when Sale seemed to have a bit of a clear out at the end of the 2010-11 season so he moves to Bath that's where he knocks out his teammate, Gavin Henson, which is one of the most famous things he's known for. Um, there's an interview with him on the rugby pod about it, and it seems like uh, Gavin Henson was well drunk at that point, and um, I think uh, Carl may have had a few as well, and Gavin was getting right up in his face, so he just he knocked him out. One punch knocked him out. So there you go. Hard man. Do not, uh, do not mess with Carl Ferns. While he's at Bath, he does get an England call-up to play the Barbars. So he does get um, time in the England jersey, but he never gets a test cap. So he gets that kind of non-test game uh, against the Barbars for England. He starts in that game. I forget if he was at number eight or number six, but he's, um, yeah, he starts for, for England in that Barbars game. And in 2012, he's part of the 42-man squad that goes to South Africa. But again, he doesn't get any game time. And I guess kind of unfortunately for him, uh, the emergence of Billy uh, Billy V probably limits his chances, uh, but he does stay in England. He plays 73 games for Bath, and um, yeah, eventually, I'm assuming um, that he kind of sees his opportunities with England as kind of being a bit limited, so that's when he ends up signing for, uh, for Lyon over in France. Now, I've seen an interview with him where he basically said that he wasn't really enjoying his rugby that much. He'd been doing it for, for nigh on 10 years. Um, and it's kind of been same, same stuff. So he was looking for a bit of a change. He signed for Lyon, knowing nothing about the city and whatnot. And he was really pleasantly surprised. And um, yeah, he ends up staying with Lyon for quite some time. And I think they were a Division 2 club. They'd just been relegated 
from um, from the top four team when he signed for them. So it's a, it's a big move to to kind of leave your your own country and leave a club you've been with for quite some time and to go and play uh, over in France. But he, he plays for them. He he doesn't. I think he signs two years initially, and then it looks like he's going to come back to England and play for Gloucester to the point where he signs a contract with Gloucester again trying to kind of get back into um maybe the uh the England framework but apparently after a conversation with Eddie Jones and I'm not 100% sure on the timeline but essentially Eddie Jones tells him he wouldn't last 15 minutes in a test match he's not fit enough and uh, Eddie doesn't seem I know Eddie's got a reputation for kind of saying some pretty harsh words to people and kind of you know, planting seeds of doubt in some guys' minds to make them kind of work harder. I'm not sure if it was that kind of reverse psychology thing, but um, eventually the deal gets cancelled with Gloucester. I think Leon have to pay out kind of a nominal fee and he re-signs with Leon. Uh, so he ends up staying with them uh, for, you know, from 2015 through to 2020. So he was supposed to go to Gloucester in, I think, 2018, but ends up kind of um, calling that off. And you got to remember, in 2017... He was like the player of the year nominee for um, for the top 14. So he's having a good time in France. He's clearly performing really well. I've seen some of his highlights. It's kind of typical number eight stuff. Big scrum going forward and he just peels off and uh, smashes into people. A few big hits. So like I mentioned, big hard man. Um, but yeah, he's playing this trade pretty well in France. He ends up playing 71 games for, um, for Lyon in both divisions overall. Um, it starts off pretty pretty poorly for him as well because I think before he even played a game he, he had an accident where he fell into like a fire. They were having some outdoor fire thing where they were cooking a pig and he ended up falling into the bloody fire and burning himself and being out for a couple months. So they didn't tear up his contract which he was um, pretty happy about. But yeah, he ended up being a pretty a pretty good acquisition for them. As I mentioned, he ends up staying longer than he initially planned. He did even talk about kind of playing for France at one point. Uh, because I guess he was in that kind of good form, and his conversation with Eddie Jones hadn't gone all that well. So he talked about the potential of playing for France, but by that point, France had already changed their own selection eligibility kind of criteria to make it that you have to have a French passport or be a French citizen to be able to play for France. And he obviously has neither. He hadn't qualified. He would have qualified under the World Rugby guidelines, but not under France's own selection criteria. So kind of nothing ever eventuated with that. It seemed to be maybe... Um, a little bit of a pushback against what Eddie had said, just uh, looking at it from the outside. Um, eventually, when his time with Lyon comes to an end, he signs with Rouen and in, um, in the D2 again in France. So he stays in France for a little bit longer, plays nine games for them, and then eventually uh, heads back to Newcastle to kind of see out his career. I think he said he's got his missus has got family kind of from the north of England. So um, I guess Newcastle, where he is still employed, I think he's on a two year deal with them as I record this. Um, seems like a pretty good place for him to be. So, yeah, man. Uh, Carl Ferns, as I mentioned, proper hard man. If you compare it to the careers of Winston Stanley and Richard Kingy, he had a much fuller career. He's got, you know, 50 plus caps, or 37 for sale, 71 for, um, for Lyon, 73 for Bath. So he's had like a really full career with a lot of game time. And um, he's kind of been a, a key performer in some of the teams that he has played for. Again, though, kind of like those previous two guys, never quite made it at that top level. And as I mentioned, maybe the the, the thing with Billy V being there, um, it's just one of those ones where you're a good player, but if somebody else is ahead of you in the picking order. We had numerous open side flankers here in New Zealand when Richie McCall was uh, the seven that kind of just had to to leave New Zealand rugby, so maybe it's a, a similar thing here, I'm not sure. Or um, some people, I've seen debate about it, some people say he never would have been, like taking Eddie's side, he never would have been good enough for test level anyway. But as I mentioned, uh, it's been an interesting one for me, because like I said, I didn't really follow the career of Carl Ferns. Hopefully I get to see a bit of him in the Premiership uh, this season with Newcastle before he kind of hangs up the boots, because he's in his early 30s at this point. But um, yeah, man, hard dude. Uh, knocked a few people out seemingly um, had a, a pretty good career around a few different clubs and uh, apart from getting England test caps did uh, did a bit of everything but yeah you guys let me know your thoughts how do you remember Carl Ferns 
Are there any other kind of major events in his career apart from knocking out, um, apart from knocking out uh, Gavin Henson that you can kind of um, recall? And um, yeah, I will talk to you guys again soon. We've got one more left, and that'll be Aaron Cruden, but um, he's probably going to be a bit more familiar than some of the other guys I have talked about, at least for uh, international level. Anyway, but anyway, you guys take care. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.